Hey everybody, Mo Buttle here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I have one of the most unique guests we've ever had on the show, 500 plus episodes, Jack Schaefer, author of, author of The Like Switch and a new book where he, well, we're going to get into that later. We're going to bring so much content to you today, audience, that I think you're going to love. Jack, why don't we credentialize you a little bit? Obviously, you're a professor, but you spent several years in the FBI in the Behavioral Analytic Analysis Program. And why don't you talk about some of your some of your content, some of your perspective in the and maybe we we start with the big idea of that that like that likability can be learned, that a ton of this is nonverbal, that people can learn how to do these kind of things. And maybe give us a touch on your background and a little bit of the headline. Yeah, I began my career with the FBI in 1980 and I retired or I, actually in 1980, I was a police officer to 1985, and then I became a special agent with the FBI, and I retired in 2005. In the last seven years of my career, I spent as a behavioral analyst. Most people are thinking about the TV shows where they have the behavioral analysts go to the crime scene and try, try to figure out who did it. We mm -hmm. don't do that work. We're a separate unit. What we do in the behavioral analysis program, we typically have su subjects or suspects or people we want to recruit in the, in the national security area. So I'll say we want to recruit somebody from a particular foreign embassy, you have them work with us to give their country secrets to us. What we do is identify that person. We look at all the personality mm -hmm. attributes of that person, all the behavioral characteristics. And then what we do is we design interviewing and recruiting strategies that take advantage of those weaknesses in that person. So that's basically what I did for seven years, and it was a fascinating job. Well, it sure sounds like it. And some of your stories in the book, everybody, just just to, as a headline, grab the book, The Like Switch, because it was just absolutely fascinating. The stories that you can weave in, Jack, and, and also the application. It doesn't sound like folks, audience members, that like, how would that apply to our world? It applies 100% because what Jack talks about in the book is an idea of what signals are you sending another person? Are you friend? Are you foe? How can you send more friendly signals? How can you pick up the clues of somebody else? So while we talk about in Grow Big Training and as you read in the Snowball System, some things around how to be more likable, Jack dives what might be a chapter or a smidge of a chapter in our content or a module, he dives really deep. So Jack, why don't, why don't we start with that? You've got, you've got a, a spectrum you call friend or foe. And then some signals that people are listening or giving that massively is nonverbal, not verbal. Can you just teach the audience a little bit about that? Yeah, basically all the stuff stems from when I talk to suspects or people we want to recruit, the first thing you need to do is to build good rapport with that person. Because if the person doesn't like you, they're not going to cooperate with you. They're not going to provide yep. you with a confession. They're gonna, not, not going to provide you with classified information from their, their government. So our chief purpose is to find ways to build quick rapport. So there's three basic signals that we can use that are nonverbals that are very powerful. And we do these and we don't realize that we're doing them. And the first one is called the eyebrow flash, which is a quick up and down movement of the eyebrows. I, I throw in the as a learning tool so people remember it. But it's just a quick up and down movement of the eyebrows. It lasts about one sixty-fourth of a second. And what that means is a long distance signal. So when you approach people, you eyebrow flash them, they have bright brow flash you back. Those are signals to say, I'm not a threat. And we do it all the time. We don't realize we do it now that I've alerted people that they do it. And they always come back and say, my gosh, I, I eyebrow flash hundreds, oh, hundreds of times a day. And I just don't realize I do it. Yeah. So it's just a friend signal. Yeah. Second, well, even, even before you go to the second and the third, like I'm thinking to the audience, like think of what, going to a, a conference, an event, walking through the airport, going through the lobby of one of your clients, meeting a panel that you're going to pitch to for the first time. This is a little signal, Jack, it sounds like that yes. it has outsized impact because think there's not many things in the world that take 1 64th of a sec second and actually have an impact. And this is one of them. So yes. just like, like by alerting us to this, we can do it more. And it sounds like it's quite effective to say, I'm not a threat. And also I'm, we're, we're moving on the, the journey to friendship. 
Right. Exactly. Okay. And I Good. do that even though I don't like the person I'm with. I'm working with a child molester. I'm working with a rapist. I have to get good rapport with that person before yeah. they're going to tell me the secrets. Yeah. So the first thing I do when I see the person is I just give them a nice eyebrow flash. Yeah. The second thing I do is I'll tilt my head to one side or the other. The reason you want to tilt your head is when you tilt your head, you expose your carotid artery and that's very vulnerable. So what Ooh. happens is you're telling that person, I trust you enough to expose a vulnerable part of my body. So you tilt your head slightly to one side or slightly to the other side. Now, I know, and I always ask people, don't take my word for this. Go out and observe it. Now, anybody who has a dog, the first thing your dog does when you walk into the house, he sits there and what? He'll tilt his head. And what is he signaling? I'm not a threat. And you mm. signal back, oh, you're such a nice dog and you tilt your head. So you're exchanging signals even amongst your 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 furry friends, right? Yeah. And also well, the dog, just, will, and I, also the dog like will I, flip, flip over for a belly rub. Basically, yeah. that's all he wants a belly rub. No. Uh, what that dog is telling you is I'm not a threat. I'm exposing the most important vulnerable part of my body. And I'm not, I'm not fearful that you're going to harm me. So yeah. you're exchanging these types of signals. Well, and I want to, another plug for the book, everybody, is Jack's incorporated an immense amount of pho photographs. So I like even that photo, you have a photo of a dog and it has a head yes. tilt. Like I'll remember that my entire life just because of that one photo. But all these different things, talking to the audience, all these different things Jack's talking about in like a million more is in the book, in their photos for you to see, oh, that's what he's talking about. Even sequence of photos to show a movement like in video, if that makes sense. All right, Jack, the third thing. Third thing is to smile. It's very difficult for when we smile at someone, it's very difficult to smile back. But what people don't realize, physiologically, when we smile, we release endorphins. Endorphins make us feel good about ourselves. So what we do is, if the, the golden rule of friendship is, if I make you feel good about you, then you're going to like me. And that's kind mm. of counterintuitive because when we first meet people, we kind of overshare things in our accomplishments and what we've done and where we've been. And it's all about us. But the secret is make it about the other person. If you make it about the other person, then the focus is on them. And as we all know, we all think the world revolves around us. And yeah. if for one time you make the world revolve around the other person, they're going to say, my goodness, this person made them realize that I'm the center of the universe. Yeah. And it makes them feel good about themselves. So the rule of thumb is if you want people to like you, you make them feel good about themselves. And if you want to fake a smile, which I've trained myself to do when I talk to these people that commit heinous crimes is you just raise your, your, your cheeks up a little bit and make sure you got some crow's feet going. Because Ooh. as soon as you're, the other person's brain sees the crow's feet, you know, because you're using all the muscles, that signals the brain that it's a uh, genuine smile. Yeah. And you said fake it, but that was actually, that is a true, like that's, you faked the real version, not a, a half smile, which isn't, yeah. which I well, saw you had in the book. People yeah. can pick up half smiles and kind of asymmetrical smiles. So you, you have to practice these things. Yep. The first step you need to do is when you go throughout your day, just kind of concentrate on when you meet people. Oh, I just, I just felt an eyebrow flash. Mm. I just saw one. So then mm. you try to emulate that. Just practice a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And after yep. a while, it doesn't take long for you to figure out, oh, I can, I can kind of fake a, a, a smile. But in my case, you have to fake it. But I think in most business cases, it's, it's a genuine yeah. liking of the other person. Yeah. So. And the thing I really want to pin around what you just said there for the audience is, is the idea of make it about them. That's one of, obviously, audience, that's one of the things you've seen, you know, thread through every single thing we teach about. It's about the client. It's about that strategic partner. It's about the other side. And when you're making them feel great about themselves, that turns back on us. So I actually had this later in the, in the interview, and I was going to drop into that golden rule of friendship, Jack, but you've already brought it up. Why don't we just dig into that now? So you, you have a, there's an idea called empathetic statements, third-party compliments. There's some things you have in the book are, that are really practical ways that you can sort of make it about the other person. Can you teach the audience about that? 
I think the first and most powerful verbal technique to get people to like you is something called the empathic or the empathetic statement. And mm -hmm. all that is, is you, you mirror what that person said, their physical state or their emotional state, use parallel language, and then feed it back to them. And you want to start your empathic statement with the word, so you, when you start, when you first start using the technique and that gets you in the habit of what? Keeping that focus on the other person, because as soon as you tell somebody, I know how you feel, what's the first thing they say? No, you don't. You're not me. Mm. You don't know how I feel. You're not suffering the way I'm suffering or, or feeling the way I'm feeling. So you say, so you must be what? happy today. And I'll give you a good example. I'm, I'm on the elevator at, at uh, Western Illinois University where I teach, and there's a girl that's smiling. So when somebody smiles, you say, they must be happy. So what's an empathic statement? Things must be going your way today. And she says, well, yeah, I studied real hard and I passed an exam. So what's an empathic statement? So the hard work you put in on that test paid off. Yes, it did. And I, you know, and she just kept going on and on and on. So if you can take whatever that person says, turn it into an empathic statement, they're mm -hmm. going to respond and give you a little bit more information. You take that little bit of added information, turn that into an empathic statement, and then you feed it back to them. And they don't even realize they're doing, they, they, they don't realize what you're doing as far as empathic statements. A lot of students will say, well, they'll understand what I'm doing. No, they won't. They, they, they don't care because the focus is on them, right? Yeah. Again, you know, it's just when I talked to one lady and, and when I was practicing this stuff when I was younger, I said, I'm just going to talk with this person and I'm not going to say anything but empathic statements. We talked for about an hour and I told her, I said, wow, it's been, you're a fascinating person to meet. I'm, I'm glad I met you. And I called her name, Marianne. And she said, well, I'm glad I met, I don't even know your name. Because the conversation was all about what? Her. Yeah. And when she left, she really had a good feeling. So, and I try to teach this to my college students. If you have a person of interest, you make that person of interest feel good about themselves. The probability that they're going to come back and want to get that same good feeling increases significantly. In yeah. fact, that person will look for excuses to come back and see you to get that same good feeling. Yeah. So I it's love not, it. It, but it's hard for people to what? Get over that ego problem. Yeah. It's they want the light you. to, sh yeah, we want the sh line, shiny light on us. You know, I think th there was a double click I want to do on one thing you said in the first example. So, so uh, things must be going your way today. Yeah. I worked hard on my test. When you replied back, so the hard work you did really paid off or something like that. One thing that struck me when you said that, just as a quick example, is that you also didn't just compliment something generic, like those shoes are really nice. You complimented her identity, hard yes. worker. So and was that intentional? That, that is intentional because we're going to talk about flattery. Flattery is a good way to build rapport with people. But saying you look nice today, you got a nice dress, nice this, nice tattoos or whatever you say, that other person is going to say, what does that person want? Mm. Because a direct compliment says that because I have students come into my office. Well, oh, Dr. Shaver, you're the best professor I've ever had in my whole life. Uh, you, I really listen and like you. And I go, what do you want? What is it you <laughs> want? Right? So that's not the way, correct way to flatter people. The, the best way to flatter people is to allow people to flatter themselves. So let's take the girl in the elevator example. I not only use an empathic statement, I use an empathic statement and daisy chained it with flattery. So when I said your hard work really paid off, she gave herself a little silent pat on the back, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Say, yeah, I, it really did pay off. I did a good job on that. So she's complimenting herself. I'm not complimenting her, but I am allowing her to compliment herself. Yep. And that's the best way. So. If the student, and I tell my students, when you come into my office, don't give me all that baloney. What you want to do is, you know, Mr. Schaefer, I, I'd like your advice on something. As soon as they say that, that puts me in a position, well, of course they want my advice because I'm the professor, you know, and it, it's, 
it's not a demand. It's, it's a request for advice. And who doesn't want to give advice to other people? Exactly. So we were that's, doing what, a- that's what I say. When you go into a business deal or something, say, hey, I'd like your advice on something. Mm-hmm. Would you like to do this or that? Or how, how does this work? Or how does that work? Don't tell people. I had a book salesman come in and try to tell me, this is a better book, Mr. Schaefer, because you know it's written better and it's better this, better that. And I, and I said, you're just insulting me. You're saying my judgment on textbooks is bad up until this point. Is that what you're saying? She says, well, no, no. I said, well, you say it. I can't pick out the right textbook. So I said, hey, psst, time out. Why don't you come in and say, Dr. Schaefer, I'd like your advice on this book. Could you take a look at it and give me some feedback? I'd be like, well, sure I would. And then I look yeah. at the book and say, wow, this book is way better than the one I'm using. I'll use it. Yeah. See, see how you get around that. You allow people to flatter themselves. And you can use it with empathic statements. Yeah, I love it. And I was with my colleague, Ryan. We were working with a big law firm this week in D.C. And some of the lawyers were, and these are really high-end, already uber successful lawyers. And they, and high-end professionals can sometimes hesitate to ask for advice. I feel like, well, I went through, you know, multiple, you know, tens of tens of thousands of hours of to, to work to get to the, be expert. I should only provide expertise to my clients. And one of the things we try to get over is like, no, no, no. When, when you're thinking about really anything, but especially about building your platform, building your book of business, bringing in the big meaty work that you want, asking for advice can A, be incredibly bonding, B, you're going to get great ideas and C, they start to become enrolled in your success. Like a quick example might be, wow, we've, we've had some great results in the trial work and the litigation we've done for your organization, Miss General Counsel. I'd like to ask for advice, you know, we have a fantastic intellectual property practice, our labor employment practice. What, what would be your advice around how we can be helpful for you in the future? Or so Jack, comment on that. Like you might have tweaks to it. I know you might be hesitant to give me feedback, but it was just an example in front of the whole audience. I want you to say to everybody listening who might be hesitating around how to ask for advice, particularly on how to grow their book of business, what's the right way to do it? That this is the right way is you ask for advice. You, you uh, allow people to compliment themselves or flatter themselves. You ask for their advice. When you ask for their advice, what happens? You become more human, don't you? You may be the greatest attorney in the world. They may look up to you, you know, I can't compete with you or whatever, but what do you do? You lower yourself and you say, hey, I'd like your advice. And that makes them feel important. And yep. that makes them like own a part of the project. And when they own a part of the project, they're going to they're gonna give you good marks on that project. And I do this when I give lectures. I, may, I make sure I talk to everybody in the audience before I give a speech, introduce myself. And then when I get up there, I always make a little mistake, like a malaprop or I mispronounce somebody's name or I, nothing that it, 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 it attacks my credibility. But they'll say, oh, you made a mistake, Mr. Schaefer. I said, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Let me, let me go back and fix that. Number one, that makes me look human. Number two, they're more likely to, to add to the conversation during the, during the presentation because I've already made a mistake. And if they make a mistake, Ooh. we're equal. Well, you made a mistake. I mean, who cares? So we just talk. And the other thing is the more you get people to participate in the process, the more they own that speech. And when it comes time yeah. for evaluations, who are they evaluating? Me or themselves? Mm. They're evaluating themselves because the more they talk, the more they own. They're not going to say, well, I suck because I participated in this a great deal and I, and I suck. And I, no, that's not going to happen. They're going to say, that's a really good presentation. So it's, it's what you're doing is you're trying to subtly include people and make them, I don't know, give them a sense of belonging and owning part of the yeah. project. And I yeah. do that with, with all my, even when I worked with all different agencies in the FBI, I always made sure everybody had a sense of participating. Yeah. Uh, we, we are so aligned on this, Jack. You, one of the things that we talk about a lot in our programs is the Ikea effect. I'm sure. You've seen that, the, I, it's a mental heuristic. It's the idea that we buy into what we help create. And what we find, like writing a proposal, talking to the audience more than you here, like writing a proposal, if you can just give a few inputs to the client, maybe maybe 2% of the overall proposal, 
and they decide on, yeah, we would like to move phase one back two weeks, you know, because a lot of our folks in France will be on holiday in August, you know, just little inputs that they can make, little dials they can fiddle with, just a couple percent of the overall thing, the entire the entire proposal becomes theirs by allowing them to have some inputs. Yeah. Is that a line, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly yep. what I do when I give speeches. Yep. That's exactly what I do when I work with other people. I always get that feedback. I may yeah. have already made up my mind for which way we're <laughs> going, but certainly everyone's going to have feedback. Without a doubt. If nothing else, they get buy-in and you usually get some darn good ideas too. Yeah. So Jack, I'd like to steer things next. One of the things in the book I liked a lot was the friendship formula. Can you just break down those three attributes? It's so darn aligned with what we teach, but it's got a little bit different flair to it. I think the audience is really going to like it. Talking about the proximity, frequency, duration. Frequency. Yep. Yep. You yep. got it. What happens is what we did in the, in the FBI, a lot of agents would come to us and say, how do you recruit sources? How do you get people to tell you information? I said, the first thing you need to do is build rapport with them, build a relationship. And they came to us and said, how do you do that? And we said, well, you just do it. But that wasn't good enough. So Joe Navarro and I, we, we are my colleague and I sat down and we said, let's thin slice human relationships. And we came up with four basic principles that go into all human relationships. The ones I you've had in the past. I love this. Audience, pay yeah. attention to this. Yeah. The one you're having in the present and any in the future. And the first thing yep. you need in a, a relationship is proximity. It can either be virtual or physical proximity. But what proximity does, it increases mutual liking. Because we like the people we see every day. Even though we don't talk to them, we may see them we still have that mutual liking at some level. Yep. So just exist with the person. The second thing you want to look for is frequency. You have to be frequently with that person to, to be able to develop that relationship. And the third one you need is duration. Not only do you have to frequently meet with that person, you have to spend some time with that person. And if you, if you look at our lives, who are the people that have the most influence on us? the people we spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. So the more time we spend with somebody, the more time we are able to influence the way they think and act. Mm -hmm. And the last one is intensity. And the intensity of re relationship is basically nonverbal stuff. The biggest one is mutual gaze. People who like one another will what? Look into one another's eyes. They will look at each other in the eye. You know, it's an interesting thing about eye gaze is that when we look into each other's eyes, we release an oxytocin, and that's a bonding hormone. So what happens is when two people, especially lovers, particularly we see that, they sit and stare at each other, tilt their heads and stare at each other's eyes. Well, that oxytocin is being produced, which creates bonds. And then let's go back to the dog thing again. I, I guarantee you, if you're a dog owner, your dog will sit in front of you, either on your lap or on the floor, and they will mm -hmm. stare intently into your eyes. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, hmm, why would the dog do that? Well, the dog does that because the dog releases endorphins when you look at him. You release in, or oxytocin when you look into the dog's eyes. And then what does that create? A bond between humans and dogs. And why, yeah. do, why do dogs do it? Because they want to get fed. They want to yeah. play. They want things. They want treats. They, that's why they, they need that person. So they've instinctively, you know, learned how to build that bond. Yeah. So that's why and they're dogs good at are, it. Dogs are considered <laughs> man's best friend. And then cats don't do that though. What cats do is a slow blink. They'll just look at you and they'll blink slow and then open their eyes up again. That's why cats are, are, are seem to be more independent animals. They say, well, cats are independent. Dogs, they're man's best friend. So that's because of the oxytocin. So that's one thing about mutual gaze is powerful. We have to look into one. I mean, you know, be obnoxious about it, but you, yeah, you just look into one another's eyes and it creates that oxytocin. Yeah. Binge. Uh, you're, you're making me crack up because I'm sitting thinking like uh, there's a blog post to be written here, a chapter in book of what can we learn about likability from dogs? 
because they're quite yeah. good at it. <laughs> yeah, they are Until very good at it. Get Gates showing exposure to like, hey, I'm showing my vulnerable part, being vulnerable. There's like, there's a whole, we could write a whole book on this, I think. I think it's funny. Okay, so we've covered, gosh, we've covered some really great stuff. I think the next thing I'd love to go to, if it's okay with you, is you had some great, like a whole chapter of really short little segments, almost like they were blog articles on the laws of attraction. Things that really struck me were things like self-disclosure, the law of, I think you called it the law of a rocky road, that how you, if you go through tough times together, you're going to bond more tightly in the end. And I think that's really important if there's some kind of client service delivery issue, we need to view that as an opportunity. Audience, I want you to view that as an opportunity because you have a chance to bond out bond more strongly at the back end of that if you solve it. Personality and purchases, I thought that was interesting, thinking about introversion and extroversion. So why don't you just, you know, you know our audience, you know these are deep technical experts that are trying to to bond with their clients to to build a book of business, to to win more of the meaty work that they want. As you think about the chapter of laws of attraction, what do you think are to pop to the top of importance for you? I think one of the major things you have to think about is that when you when you release information about yourself, you shouldn't overshare. What you want to do if you have a, especially if you have a long term relationship with a client, number one, you make it all about them, and then when they ask you some questions, you just give them a little piece, and then you know, a couple of months down the road, you give them a little, another little piece and another little piece. And th- they're thinking, wow, every time I meet this person, I learned something that's kind of unique about that person. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot, a lot of times, especially in the dating scene, people data dump because they want to impress the other person. What you have to do is make it all about them and just throw them, what I call it Hansel and Gretel. You just throw them a, a little bit of knowledge. And they go, oh, that's interesting. Well, but you lead such a more interesting life yourself. Go on about them. And then mm-hmm. as time goes on, after a year, two years, of your, your, you have a long-term relationship with this person, it's still new, isn't it? Because you're forever what? Giving them bits and pieces of new information about your life and what you do. Mm-hmm. And for sales, that's great for, for long-term sales. Yeah. The other thing about long-term sales is you want to use something that I call the bridge back. So if I meet you, well, let's start, let's start with the conference. We're, we're at a conference and there's people we don't know and we're a little shy. We don't know who to talk to. Who do we approach? And we want to, you know, get new clients or we want to introduce ourselves. So there's a rule of thumb. If there's room to put your feet, it's okay to meet. So if you have two people that are side by side like this, toe to toe, yeah, there's no room for your feet, right? So don't talk to those people. They're, they're engaged in a private conversation. Now, if they talk and their feet are pointed outwards and there's a little space there, and I'm sure you've seen that, the little space between the feet. Yeah. yeah. If you can put your feet there, it's okay to meet. So then you walk up and then you, you know, gradually put yourself into the conversation using empathic statements. You start with the eyebrow flash, the head tilt, the smile, hi, and then you wait and then you you know, in, engage in the flow of the conversation and you know they won't reject you. Yeah. So that's the number one thing you want to do. And then the, the, then you're going to meet them an, another time. Say you're going to meet your client maybe a month later and you want to learn enough about that client to be able to say, oh, I met you at that conference. How's your wife doing? I understand she was feeling bad or she had a surgery or your, how's your kid? Or your kid was getting married or graduate, how did you, you know, whatever, something to what bridge That's the back. bridge back. Yep. And if the, what the bridge back does is it allows you to pick up the rapport building process where it left off mm. when you departed the first time from that person. Mm. So and, that's a great thing. You know, I think about audience, I think about business development meetings where you've had an introductory meeting, say with one of your experts, you've introduced them to a client that you know, and there's a big opportunity. Well, how we might think about the very beginning of that next meeting is the bridge back. I really like this, Jack. Say, hey, just before we get into it, I know we're going to talk about the analysis we did on XYZ with Jasmine, the expert. Uh, hey, we're just curious. How did the big meeting go that you were going to have yeah. the Tuesday after we talked last? We've, we've been yeah. curious. How'd it go with the team? So just yeah. something, and it seems like, Jack, that also says 
I'm paying attention. I yeah. care about you. I remembered. Like, it seems like it accomplishes a lot with sort of one question. Yeah. And what you can do is just take a little note. If you have to, if you're on the phone or you're meeting with somebody after that meeting, you know, you won't remember it 30 days from now or 45 right. days when you meet the person, you put a little note there, you know, and then yep. when you, when you call that person up, you go like, oh, Ridgeback. I do yep. that all the time. Oh, I love it. So you, my, so dentist, you. my dentist did it to me the other day. I was sitting in there again in my dentist chair and the dentist says to me, how was your trip to Italy? I just, you know, you told me you were going to take a cruise. And I went, yeah. how did you remember that? That was like yeah. six months ago, you yeah. know? So it's the bridge back. Yeah. And I and did. Sudden, I, I said, I know what she's doing, but I do feel good about it because. <laughs> exactly. That's the great know, thing about I, this stuff. You know, right. I know, I know she's. She's using this technique, but yeah. I still feel good. I like her because she's <laughs> made attention to me, you know? I think that you, you don't know our content as well, but, but one of the neat things about it is 100% about everything we teach is that you do things for the best interest of all involved. Like you, we should be able to, to name what we're doing with our clients in a way that they would go, yeah, that's awesome. Like, hey, yeah. we're going to offer an investment and here's why we're doing it. And I just think it's neat to be able to have things like that, that are, you can be ridiculously transparent and it's still great. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, go, go deeper though on the Rocky Road idea, because I do think that's important. So many times as professionals, the, the things that our audience are doing are ridiculously technical. They're the best in the business. The things that they do is super hard. There are many times, dozens and dozens, and in some cases, thousands of tens of thousands of stakeholders, especially as our as their work might impact an entire organization. So things can go wrong. And I think how our audience needs to think about that is if things go wrong, obviously you try to avoid that. It's not good, but high points can come out of those low points. And so can you talk about the idea of the Rocky Road? I, I, I died when you gave the Hallmark movies as an example about oh, yeah. how two people, yeah. the Hallmark movie, like you always like the two, the people that are going to fall in love are like, they, it's always this rocky start. And then you know exactly what's going to, you already know who's going to get married in the end. Yeah. Like, can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I think the mindset of that, if something goes wrong, it can actually become a huge win later on. Yeah. If it, this, is, this particularly works when you initially meet a new client and for some reason you don't get along. So what you have to do is now you have to bring, bring to bear your, your report building tools and use empathic statements, find out what, what's going wrong. And then you, if you keep at it and you develop a good relationship after that initial bad relationship, that, that will be a tighter bond than if you didn't. And a lot of times, you know, I, I don't know if, if you want to get into the, how to deal with angry people, but we can go over that very quickly, especially Let's if do you it. run into a problem with somebody. So the first thing you want to do is you don't want to engage an angry person because they're not thinking properly because they're engaged in the fight flight process. So what you want to do is allow that person to vent. And, uh, and the first thing you, you in the venting process is explain to them why you're doing what you did that got them angry. I, you know, we're doing this because this is our company's policy and this is the way we have to do it. And then all of a sudden that person's world becomes in sync again because we get frustrated and angry because our world is not going to the way we expected it. It's out of yep. sync. Yep. So what we have to do is get that world back in sync. And the quickest way we can get somebody's world back in sync is to explain to them, this is why we're doing this. This is why we have to do it this way. You know, oh, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, well, oh, that makes sense. World becomes in sync again. Now, if that doesn't work, you, wanna, you, you, you don't want to engage that person with you know, all kinds of rationalities because they're not listening. But you, what you want to do is allow them to vent. And how do you allow them to vent? You use an empathic statement. So you're angry because we didn't get this, this, this object done or the objective done that you're supposed, that we were supposed to have done. And of course, as soon as you recognize that, that person is going to vent some more. Well, yeah, I counted on you. I thought I trusted you. You let me down. You betrayed me. Then you come in with another empathic statement. So you feel as though. You know, we let you down because we didn't make the deadline. And then, and then they go, yeah, and they'll vent a little bit more. And then they're done venting. You can see their shoulders will sag down. 
They'll exhale a deep breath. I mean, they're done venting. So when they're done venting, you want to introduce what I call a presumptive statement. That's a course of action, which that person has a very difficult time refusing. So you're, you're upset because we didn't meet our objective. Tell you what, why don't, from now on, why don't we do milestones? So it will go a certain, certain way into the project. We'll have milestones to make sure that we're both on board with this. And then if there's changes, we can make them. And then we'll have another milestone. And then we'll make sure that project gets done the way you expect it to be done. What's the person going to say? No, I don't want that. Yeah. Can't, it, it's just, it's an ideal way, but what do you have to do? It has, it can't be about you. The first thing you want to do when somebody's angry at you is you want to become defensive. Yeah. Don't become defensive. Find out why they're angry and give them a course of action they can't refuse because it's not about you. It's about getting a job done. It's about getting paid. It's by fulfilling contracts. It's, it's fulfilling whatever goods or services you, you're producing and you're, you're, you're trying to sell. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. I think that's a great process. And the, the, the visionary component of all that, everybody in the audience is, is if you do that kind of things that Jack just taught us, you can take what was a negative relationship to not just yeah. strong, but uber strong because you exemplified, you know, being a great partner, listening, playing things back, these empathic statements. And then, of course, solving the problem with some great over communication and things as you go forward. So that I think what's neat about that, Jack, is if people remember that you know, save this interview when things go wrong, come back, look at the time span stamp, you know, watch that segment that Jack just taught us. And we need to remember that high points can come out of the low points that a bat, something when it goes wrong, that's a moment for us to dive in, do what Jack just said. And then we actually have an enhanced chance of having a really strong relationship later yes. if we do the right things. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, it's just a reminder before I forget, I blog for psychology today magazine. And there's over 160 blogs and they're short blogs and they cover just about everything that mm. we're talking about today. So if somebody wants to go back and review some of these topics and maybe, you know, research some new topics or, or look at some other tips or techniques, that would be a great way to do it for free. It's, it's uh, psychologytoday.com. It's That's just, awesome. It has all well, the good. Yeah, well, what just, we'll do is everything we'll, there. You know, yeah, we'll you know, put that down in the show notes too so that everybody can get to it really quickly. But I didn't even know about that. So that's, I'm going to check it out myself. Yeah. Okay. And it's just, it's just snippets. Yep. And easy. One of the snippets is controlling angry people and eyebrow flashes and detecting deception and doing all kinds of, all kinds of tricks and tips. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So I think I'd like to move on to sort of a new area of, of content. You've got a new book out. Now I haven't yes. read it yet, but I've heard a little bit about it. I'm pretty excited. So can you give us a little sneak peek into the new book? Yeah, it's called The Truth Detector. In other words, what we're doing is using elicitation techniques to get people to reveal sensitive information without them realizing that they're revealing sensitive information. So what elicitation does, it creates an environment wherein people want to tell you things where they probably would not reveal those things had, it, had you asked them a direct question. So the elicitation is powerful. We use that in law enforcement and espionage and counterintelligence all the time because we want to get information from people without them knowing it. And the most powerful technique is called the presumptive technique. You present somebody with a statement, either true or false, and they will either confirm it or they will correct you and add information. Like you're from, you're from like New England, aren't you? Well, I live in Atlanta, but I grew up in rural Indiana. Oh, you just did it. You stink. <laughs> oh, I fell for it. I just grabbed onto that hook and just ran and swam in the water, didn't I? Yeah, and my next statement would have been, oh, Indiana, that's a, that's a rural area. You like rural areas. Yeah. And they say, no, I don't. I like this. I like that. We could go on yeah. forever that way. Yeah. Oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Audience, I've just been taken. <laughs> I love well, it. I think, well, that's the best way for people to realize how powerful these techniques yeah. are yeah. Is, is to use them on people. Yeah. And then they realize, oh my gosh, I just fell for that. 
Yeah. So this is, I, I look at it as offensive to get people to give you information yeah. and also the defense. If somebody wants to get your personal information to steal your identity, I want you that we have a, a saying, name it and claim it. If you try a technique on me, I'll say, oh, that's a presumptive statement you're using on me. It won't work. And that gives you what? Inoculation against some con man trying to get mm. your personal information if you're aware of how mm. they do it. Mm. So it's offense and defense. Yeah. So so tidy this up for me, Jack, because this the whole we even well, let me take a step back for for the audience. Everything we teach is always about the common good for all involved and that we're doing to do the right thing for the client. So while even even when I heard even here, when I hear words like tips or techniques or tricks, especially, I feel like, ooh, I just have a, like an icky feeling around it. But as I was listening to you talk about it, the presumptive statement, that can be used for good too. So if yeah. we're trying to help a client and we're trying to figure out who does their other consulting or legal or other or uh, their healthcare work, or we're trying to figure out who decision makers are, or we're trying to figure out what budgets look like. How would we use what you talked about in a way that is in a, sort of in the benefit for all? So obviously, what you do in your work is get the initial information. Then you have to pass it on, of course, to your boss. And he's the actual decision maker. Mm. And, then and then I somebody see might say, well, no, actually, the CFO, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. in law, I'm, in the, I'm in the legal department. Actually, the CFO needs to prove this one. Or, yeah. So, yeah, keep going. This is, this is helpful. Yeah, that's that's the that's the way I would do it. Just make those presumptive statements and they're they're gonna correct you. Or they'll say, Yeah, no, I'm the one that makes the decisions. Yeah. What's neat and, about and, that? But you're not asking them. You're not saying you're so low on Who the totem the decision pole, makers. I don't yeah. want to talk to you because I want to yeah. talk to the decision maker. You want to say to yourself, Who is the decision maker I have to see to make sure that that person can authorize the the payment or the money or the transaction? Yep. yep. So then that, what you want to do is make that person your ambassador. Yeah. And how you do that is it's called 30 third party compliment. I, I really like the company, you know, first you build rapport with that person and then you say, you find out who the CEO is or who the, the man with the money is. And you say, Oh, I've heard about him. He's that guy. You know, I, I really like the way he manages things. He does a good job. This company is actually very healthy financially. And I think it's due to his techniques or whatever, his yep. way of doing it. Financial things. acumen or processes yeah, or whatever. Fin yep. Financial acumen. So now this person is going to go to that decision maker and said, I just met Jack Schaefer. You know what? He said that you were, he liked the way you do business. He said this, and that's called the third party compliment. So. If somebody directly compliments you, you have a tendency to say, what do you want? Shields up. What do you want? Mm -hmm. But now if somebody comes up and says, you know, I heard that you have one of the best logs that, that are available for, for lawyers and business people. Yep. And you go like, uh huh. And then you give yourself a nice pat on the back. You will yep. believe that if I said somebody else told me that versus me saying, oh, you know, you're the best you know, blogger person I've seen ever, you know, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Which you want to do is get turn defensive. people into your personal ambassadors that will what? State your case for you. And I know people think this is manipulation, but, and I, I know that's what you were hinting at, yeah, but it's exactly. not, it's putting the best you forward. Yes. Isn't the that, best you, that is it. The best you forward is what? Is making the other person happy with you, number one, like yep. you. Number two, they say, I like that person's the way they do business. I like the product they sell. Isn't that what we need to do? Yeah. Is that manipulation? Well, no, it's it's symbiotic relationship with somebody. And you're yeah. increasing the probability of having a successful relationship. Why would you not do it? Yeah. Well, and, and we have to get the yes to to get hired to make the big impact we want. That's where yes. we're going to get the 10x or the 100x. I mean, all of our audience, of course, they want to be financially successful, but no, that's not why they're doing this work. They're doing whatever work they're doing because they want to make an impact. And you can't make the impact 
if you don't yep. get hired and you can't get hired unless you turn people into your ambassadors, especially for yes. the big stuff. Because mo- yep. anything big, a whole bunch of people, men and women have to approve it. So Jack, it's really good stuff. Now, I also know you do some work with like lawyers around getting into the truth detection part of it, like in depositions and things like that. How how can you, or what what can our broader audience learn from that work? Obviously, some of it's in your new book, but I'm also thinking that practical, I want to give them stuff that's not in the book that you know from your interactions. So what what can we teach the whole audience about what they need to know about deception, about seeing when somebody's not being truthful, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you some some practical, I don't want to say tips, tricks, or techniques. I'll say practical you can say uh, tips. Example. Tips is good. Tips is great. Okay. Tricks right. is what I would like to avoid. Yeah. Okay. Practical t- tips. Tips. Yeah. The first one is something called the lip purse. All okay. right. When you're talking to somebody and you purse your lips, and I'm going to exaggerate now, right? Just push your lips out forward. Okay. Like, yeah, that's an exaggeration, yep. but you see yep. that all the time. Yep. What that nonverbal signal means is that person has formed a negative opinion about what you just said. So you're giving a sales presentation, you're talking to a client, and you're talking about the goods and services, you're talking about the timeline of delivery, and then you get to money, and they what? Purse their lips. That Ooh. means the, the objection is going to be about money, not anything else. So now the technique here is you want to get that person to change their mind before they articulate, no, it's too expensive. Because if they articulate it, there's something called the psychological principle of consistency. When we say no, yep, very difficult for us to change our minds. So when you see that lip compression at, or the lip purse at money, you say, use an elicitation technique. I'll bet you're thinking this might be too costly for you. But let me explain to you why the extra money is going to save you a lot in the future. And then you, it, you get that person to change their mind while they're still in their mind. You don't allow them to say no. In the beginning of that statement is, I'll bet you're thinking. And so you're well, like, that's, you, that's the, you could use a lot of, you could use the presumptive. You could use, I like, I bet you're thinking. That's just yeah. where you're trying to quote internal dialogue of somebody else. Yeah. I've heard some people say things like a lot of our clients think at this point or at this stage or other people. A common question I get at this point is, yeah, yeah. are those other examples? Yeah, those, yeah. Those are kind of examples of the same thing. Yeah. But I like, I'll bet you're thinking. Yeah. I, I it's just direct. Like to use, yeah. I like to yeah. use that. It's more direct. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that if you want to know if somebody's telling you the truth about something and you don't want them to know that you're testing their veracity, there's a powerful technique called the well technique. What's that? And that, is, and that is this. If I ask you a direct yes or no question and you begin your response with the word well, it means you are about to give me an answer you know I'm not expecting. So I'll give you a quick example and then we'll give you a business example. I send my kid in to do his homework in his bedroom. Time for the shenanigans, nothing but homework going on. Not, no homework going on. He comes out of his bedroom an hour later and I say, did you do your homework? He said, well, I said, get back in there and do your homework. How do you know that, Dad? I'm in the FBI. I know these things. Get back. You're lying to me. But how do I know that? When he comes out and I say, did you do your homework? What answer does he think I'm expecting? Yes, Dad, yes. I did my homework. Yep. If he says, well, it's any answer but yes. Any, yep. but, any answer but yes is no. So do you like the product that, do you like the the terms and conditions of the contract. Well, that means what? They don't. Yep. Yep. Did you get everything accomplished that I told you today? You have all your assignments I gave you. Did you get them all accomplished? Well, the answer is no. Yep. So when somebody, am I getting the day off next week? Well, that no. (laughs) Right. So then what, after somebody has articulated a negative and objection, what's your, what, what process do you recommend to overcome that? Well, as far as somebody saying, uh, well, I would say 
So you're upset about this particular thing and uh, use an empathic statement. And then you go back to empathic. And then, and then you yep. want to what? Change the terms or conditions or find out what that person wants. Yep. And Dig then in. you use empathic statements to find out what they want. So you're yep. looking for something that's more detailed. You're looking for something that's more uh, robust. You're looking for something that's cheaper. And, and you're just throwing out these statements and they're going to what? Yeah. They're going to tell you. Or answer. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to correct or affirm it. Yeah. And that's consistent. We've got a little methodology that says whenever, whenever somebody does articulate some kind of objection, the best thing to do is somehow dig in to your point and figure out what is precisely underneath. Because yeah. if somebody just says, wow, this is more than I was thinking it would cost. Well, did they do a spreadsheet and they actually know it's 12.3% higher? Or are they fine with the cost? They don't, they're worried about what their boss would say. It could mean a million things. So I think that empathic statement or just a question back. Hey, well, why do you say that? Something to get them to, to talk. But see, I, I, I don't like questions because people get on the defensive when you ask a question. Because they say, why do they want the information? What are they going to use it for? How should I answer? What, what should I say? So if you use an empathic statement, you can get the same information without a person becoming defensive. I see. So if somebody says, wow, this is costing a lot more than I thought it would. What would yeah. you say? So you were looking for something that was a little cheaper. And you're going to say, yes, I was because this budget and this, oh, so your budget doesn't allow for the extra expense. So it's the, hey, it's, how, about, yeah. what, how about if we change the terms and conditions? If we eliminate this aspect of the, the, the product, we can probably get that cost down to, yep. to within range of where you're going. Yeah. So, you know, you see how you can take that and, and through elicitation, yep. get that. And then, they, then you could say, well, I'd like your advice on how maybe we could cut this down for you. What are some of the things that you feel that you might not need? as urgently as some other things. And we could focus on the yep. things that you most need versus the things that, that are nice, but you don't need yep. them. Yeah. So I'd like yeah, your exactly. advice on that. Could you? Could yeah. You... It, and now they're into co-creation mode like we talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's really interesting. And, you know, in, even if that little example we were playing for, with about it, it costs more than I thought, like a lot of our audience, it will rush in and go, oh my gosh, well, do you want a discount? But you just, audience, you don't know that's even the thing. You've got to get in back and forth with them. And I, and I love your technique, Jack. Like they might be willing to say the, pay the same price, but split it up over two budget years because we're yeah. near the end of their fiscal year. Like who knows what it is, but yeah. rushing in with a solution before you know precisely what to do is a huge it's not mistake. not a good idea. Yeah, exactly. In well, this has been the first one who reveals the bottom line or their, hot, their cards basically loses. Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't yeah. use a listation to find out what they're holding in their hand. And yeah. And you come back with the appropriate response. Yes. This is brilliant. Okay. Do you have time for one more question? Then we'll tell people yeah. how they can get in touch with you. Okay. So sometimes we have these rapid fire questions to the end, but we're, I think we're at time. So I'd like to just focus on one. What lies do you hear given all the content, sort of the domain that we've been talking about? What lies do you hear people have in their head? a soundtrack they have in their head that gets in their own way that they need to get out. Uh, you mean in business sense or personal sense? More Probably, probably more in, in business. Yeah. In, insecurity. Mm. I think people, all people are insecure. Some people are more insecure than others. But what we do is we do put a lot of self-doubt in our mind because we're insecure. Yep. And the only way to get secure is to get experience. So older people are less insecure. Why? Because they're more experienced and they have confidence. So the younger the person is, the more insecurities, the more insecurities, the more vulnerable they are. So they, they're doubting themselves. I what think that's probably what most people, it's their tripwire is that insecurity. Yeah. yeah. So if I really focus on our domain, business development, building a book of business, People, by the time they listen to this podcast, go through our programs, they've already learned how to do the work, whatever technical work, account management work at a big healthcare company, a lawyer, a consultant, whatever. Now they're learning how to win the work. Well, this is this whole new area of insecurity. So can I ask your advice on one thing, Jack? Sure. 
<laughs> of course, we're like smiling mentally back and forth. That was like half a joke and half for real. Uh, <laughs> what would be your advice for somebody? Let's say they just got minted partner at a big professional service firm, or they just got mint, they just got promoted for the first time after 15 years. They're an account exec for a really big healthcare client or a, or a dozen of them. What's your advice on how they can speed up the time to have less insecurities around the winning of the work? It's okay to be wrong. Ooh. Because I have my students that are perfectionists. They cry when they get 96 versus 100 on a test, and I'd be doing the happy dance, but they're crying because they want to be perfect. And I tell them, the sun's going to rise tomorrow if you, you, you give me a wrong answer. The sun will set. Your parents will love you. Your friends will love you. Everything's going to go on just the way it is. And what you want to do is admit, and, and I use this in my career a lot. People come up and say, you're a PhD in psychology, and you don't know what I just talked about, the psychological principle? No, I don't. Please explain it to me. Right? And be okay with that. It'd be okay. It's okay. So if you you finally get this high fluting job, sometimes you get in the the imposter uh, yep. uh, uh, syndrome syndrome or what? Right. Yeah. Or so what you want to do is you want to just talk to somebody. And say you know I don't know what's going on here. Maybe you can help me out. I'm brand new. And then once you get used to doing that, it's okay now to be wrong. Mm -hmm. It's okay to ask people for advice. It's okay to ask people. A lot of people have that pride that won't allow them to say, I don't know what I'm talking about. I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's, that is, that's a defense mechanism to guard against that insecurity. Yeah. Audience, that is gold. It's gold. I even like how you, that, that phrasing, I haven't heard of exactly before. I never, just never noticed it, Jack. Hey, I'm new, new here. I'm new to leading this client. I know Jane's been with you for 10 years. Can you help me learn what, what success looks like? Can you help? Can you, Gosh, I could come up with a million questions after that. Yeah. But just having that openness, now you're going to get co-creation. Now you're going to get somebody enrolled in your success. Now you're going to learn more. That's really, it's almost the answer to everything in life, isn't it? Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know anything is the answer. <laughs> and as soon as they say, well, you don't know that, you say, no, I don't. Yeah. That's why I'm yeah. here. I yeah. know it. I wouldn't be here. Yeah. I but love see, it. that makes you, once you get over that once or twice, then it's comfortable. You're yeah. very relaxed. And then people won't ex have high expectations of you. You'll just be a human being that makes mistakes, looks for advice, and you make yep. them feel good because yeah. you're going to them say, may I have your, you know, can you give me some advice on this? I, and they're going, well, yeah. of course, because I'm, I'm the guy here. You're not, yeah. but I am. So yeah. you allow them to flatter themselves. You're building rapport. Yeah. You're getting a relationship going. And isn't that what humans are supposed to do with other humans? Oh, the bottom what a line is we're yeah. supposed to be nice to other people, make their day just that much better for having met yeah. us. Jack, that's the perfect closing to this episode. You, I just have to say, you've worked really hard at being a great podcast guest, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> no. That's only because I have a great host bring the best out in their podcast guests. <laughs> yes, I've worked so hard to be a great host. Just, no, but I mean, all joking aside, audience, this is just brilliant stuff. And I really mean that sincerely, Jack. I, I can real point out a whole bunch of different specifics, but I'll skip over that. You can just see me leaning in the whole time. So you knew me. You knew you had me from the beginning. <laughs> all right. So people are going to want to reach out to you. I would just do what I mentioned a couple of things to the audience. Not only are Jack's books fantastic, I've dug into the like switch. Tell me the name of the other one, Jack, the, the your new truth one. Truth Detector. The, truth Detector. It's an ex-FBI agent's guide to getting people to reveal the truth. Oh, it's just so like like switch was so interesting. And now you're getting to this world of espionage and all that stuff. It's super cool. Yeah. And you also, you're still doing some keynotes, not as, quite as much as you were, but you're still doing some keynotes. So Audience yep. members, you're having a big practice area meeting, a partner retreat, a big global sales kickoff. You know, a lot of times those happen at the beginning of the year. Jack would be great for those, especially if he likes the location. And you're also <laughs> you're also working with some lawyers around depositions yep. and review of some of their techniques and things like that. So yep. where should people reach out to you if they want to learn more about you? If, if they want, they can, I'll, I'll give them my email address. It's sure. Jack Schaefer, J-A-C-K, 
S-C-H-A-F-E-R 500 at yahoo.com. Got it. And That's awesome. That so if nothing else, audience, if I uh, oh, will put that down in the show notes. So it's Jack Schaefer, Schaefer obviously I got your name spelled, and then 500 at yahoo.com, no dots or dashes or anything other no. than the, the dot com. Good. And then also, maybe you and I can go back and forth and pick a couple of the blog posts that are in psychology today that you think would be particularly interesting to this group. We can put the, the broad base, hey, here's all Jack's stuff, but then there might be a couple that we think are interesting, and we'll put those down in yeah. the show notes too. Yeah. Jack, this has been, I, I had high expectations. I'm just so thrilled that, that you were able to make the time. This was awesome. Thanks for all your help. Uh, you're welcome. 